internet. I'm Michael and this is Two Can Play That Game. So today on the show we will be looking at Comet. And of course, as normal, our first video will be teaching you how to play the game and then the next video will give you an example of the game being played and then the final video you'll be able to find out my thoughts on the game in my review and of course whether or not Two Can Play That Game. But what is Comet about? Well, let's take a look at the box. So, on this box, we have a scene of battle, and we have lots of Egyptian kind of bits coming through here, because we've got an ank in the letter T, we've got scarabs on the E's, we've got an eye of Ra up here, we've got eagly guy, doggy guy, and a mummy. So, not surprising that this game is about battling in Egypt. But, is it really about battles in Egypt? Well, a large part of it is, and that will actually break ties. But what it actually is, is about area control. And obviously how you're going about that area control often is with battles. But you don't necessarily end up in battles all the time. If you're not clear on what I'm talking about, why don't we take it to the table and you can see what I mean. Welcome to the table for how to play Kermit. So first things first, let's talk about how to set up the game. So the first thing you're going to want to do is get your game board out. And the game board has two different sides. You have this side here, which is for your three and five player games. And you can identify this side of the board easily because the top here, it has the spaces for tracking turn order. Now on the three and five player side, you have a space for three and a space for five. On the other side of the board, you'll have a two and a four for the two and four player games. Also on the three and five player games, you have the sanctuary of all gods, which is this blue building here. And that does not appear on the two and four player side of the board. Now, obviously, this being two can play that game, we want to be setting up a two player. So let's flip this over. And we have now two and four player side of the board. Now, for a two player game, we will only be using this left hand side of the board. This right hand side here will not be used. That would only be used on a four player game. And the same goes when you're doing the three and five player on the other side that you use the left hand side for the three player and the full thing for the five player. So that's the board. So the next thing you then want to set out is the power tiles if you have room. Now the power tiles are split into three different colours. So we have our blues, our reds and our whites and they are split into four different levels. We have level one tiles which have a single ank in the top left corner. Then our level two that have two anks, our level threes and our level fours. Obviously, if you don't have space to set these out, you can just have them near the board available for when people do buy them. OK, so let's talk briefly about these power tiles. So as I've already said, the level of the tile is given in the top left, represented by a number of ank symbols. Then we have just an image that portrays the effect of the tile. The circle here indicates when the power below this takes effect. So if it has the daylight symbol, it would be in daytime rounds. If it has the nighttime symbol, it would be during the night phase. And finally, if it has the battle symbol, it would be during the battle phase. Then the final bit to say about these power tiles is the bit at the bottom here tells you what the power does. I'm not going to go through them all, but for instance, this one is when you pray, rather than getting two, you would get three prayer points. The game does come with a leaflet that gives you a rundown of all the different power tiles telling you what they're called and what they do. Next you'll want to get the 
round temple temporary victory tokens which look like this and you'll need to put one of those on each of the temples in play. So we would put one here and then on any of the other temples. Then if you were playing a three or five player game you would put the blue victory to point tokens on the sanctuary of all gods as so and then next all the other victory point tokens would want to be put near the board in, within easy reach of all players. So next each player would want to pick which will be their home city. So in this two player game we have a city here and a city here. There is no real difference between them gameplay wise. They are actually equidistant to all locations. So just go whichever one is closest to where the player is sitting. Then each player will need to be given a player board, the five action tokens of their colour, you can just put those there, they'll need their square player order token and that will get put on the board in random order for the first time. Also they'll need the oval token and this is their prayer point tracker and that will start on the number five along this track at the top here. They will also get 12 units of their colour. Next they'll get the six battle cards of their colour and the colour is on the edges of the cards and the blue one is for some reason grey. Also give each player one of the three different colours of pyramid. So we've got the blue, the red and the white. Next you'll need to shuffle the Divine Intervention cards. Once done, just deal one to each player. If you want to find out the effects of all of the Divine Intervention cards, they are covered in the same leaflet that has all the powers in. However, I will briefly talk about the layout of these cards. So if there is any cost to pay this, to play this card in prayer points it will be listed in the top left here for example this card would cost one prayer point to play then in the middle here you have the effect of the card so this does plus two damage and at the bottom here you have the symbol indicating in which phase of play you are able to play it once each player has been given a divine intervention card then place the deck near the board within easy reach of all players then for the first turn you'll want to determine turn order randomly with the first player being on the right hand side, second player being on the left hand side and you'll just put those at the top of the board and then when it changes later on in the game you just move them around and obviously you just use a larger space if you're playing with more players. Next you'll need to choose what level your pyramids are going to start at. So you have three points that you can spend on them. So you could either have them all at one. So that's with the one at the top there. Or you could choose to have one at zero, which means you leave it out of play, and have one pyramid at two and one pyramid at one. So having chosen what value pyramids you want, you would then place them into your starting city. So we have here the blue player's starting city. If they chose to do all three, they would just place each on the, on the one value in each of the different segments of the city. You can tell the different segments because in the picture they are separated by walls and they, the cities are also surrounded by walls. I will talk later on about what those walls actually do. So if we were only having two pyramids out, say we had the white at two, the red at one, we would have two sections with pyramids in, not three. Next, you'll want to place 10 of your 12 units in your cities. The limits on this is that you have to place them in regions where you have pyramids. So I, in this situation, I would not be able to place them in this section of the city because there is no pyramid there. Also, you can only have a maximum of five in any group of units. So we have here a five and we'd have to have a five here as well because we're not allowed to put any here and we're not allowed any more here. So that is then set up complete. You are ready to start playing. So with the game all set up to play, let's talk a bit about the phases of the game. So 
as I've already said when I was talking about the powers and the divine intervention cards, uh, there are three phases. There are two main play phases and then there is also the battle phase that will only occur when a battle is happening. So let's talk about the main phases. The first one we have is the knight phase. Now, first thing you'll do in this knight phase is each player gains two prayer points. Woohoo! Nice freebies. Next, each player, in turn order, will get an extra divine intervention card off the top of the deck. Again, freebies. We like this. So next is where it starts to get a bit more interesting. Now, in the first round, this will not happen. But in later rounds, you would activate any knight power effects you have. So that's anything with the knight symbol on it. Then in all rounds except for the first round, because you already just randomly determined your turn order, you'll then determine your turn order. To determine the turn order, the player with the fewest victory points just picks what it will be. So they can, in a two-player game, they can pick to go first or second. However, if both players have the same number of victory points, whoever was the first player before out of those, so in a two-player game it would be whoever was the first player, gets to determine the turn order. So exact same way as whoever has the fewest. So the first part of the day phase is to use your actions. And of course, these actions are what make up the meat and bones of the game, where you'll be choosing each time you choose an action, which action you do from this pyramid of actions on your player board. So the first player would choose an action by putting a token on it. They would then perform that action. And once they have performed the action, it would then be the next player's turn to pick an action until all players had used all of their five available action tokens. So some rules and restrictions on placing the action tokens. If you have already used a space on your pyramid, you can, cannot put another action token on it. You can only put action tokens on empty spaces. This is why some of the actions such as moving and prayer, praying have multiple spaces so that you can do them multiple times in a round. The next rule with regard to selecting actions is your pyramid of actions has three levels and by the time you have used all five of your actions you must have an action from each of the levels. You can't do all four of the bottom for example and one of the middle because then you haven't used one of these top two. So let's take a closer look at a player board. So this gold circle at the top here you don't need to worry about it only comes into effect if you buy a certain power tile. Next we have a move action represented by a disembodied leg then we have the recruit action, and I'll go through shortly what each of the different actions actually means. Next, we have raise pyramid. Again, another move action. The prey action. Then we have buy power tiles. Now, there are three spaces, one for each colour, so you will only ever be able to buy one power tile of each colour in a round. So we have the white, the red, and the blue here. And then finally, we have another prayer action. So what are all those actions, though? Well, let's talk about the simplest one first. So we've got these prey actions down here. And what they do is instantly give you two prayer points whenever you select them. Simple as that. Next, let's talk about raising a pyramid. So when you do the raise pyramid action, you will spend prayer points equal to the level that you want to move to. So if you are on level two on the pyramid, you could spend three pair points to move to level three. You can only increase a single pyramid per raise pyramid action. However, you can increase that pyramid by multiple levels. So if you had three pyramids all on one, you wouldn't be able to spend six to increase each of them to two, for example, with one action. But what you could do is spend two prayer points to go to level two, and then an additional three to go to level three, 
all in the same action. So you can spend a total of five to go straight from one to three. Next, let's talk about these three down here, the buying power tiles. Now, when you buy power tiles, you will pay a number of prayer points equal to the level of the power tile you want to buy. So if it was a level one, you'd spend one, a level two, two, etc. However, there are restrictions on what you can buy. Obviously, colour-wise, whichever space you have used, so the white, the red, or the blue, indicates that you must buy a power tile of that colour. Additionally, whenever you are buying a power tile, you need to have the appropriate pyramid at the appropriate level. So if you were buying a blue power tile, you would need your blue pyramid out on the board at the same level as the power you wanted to buy. So if you had it at level one, you would not be able to buy anything other than a level one blue tile. Another rule when buying power tiles is you cannot buy two identical power tiles. So there are some powers that are on all the different colors. For example, gain a victory point. If you have already bought that power tile of one color, you cannot buy it of the other colors as well. Also, with some of the lower level power tiles, there are actually multiples of the exact same tile. And again, the same rule applies. You can only have it once. When you do buy a power tile, you'll take that power tile and it will simply sit in front of you and you will immediately start gaining the benefits of that power tile. It's important to note here that a big part of the strategy of Comet comes from what power tiles you choose to buy and the combinations you make with them. So next, let's talk about the recruit action. Now, the recruit action you use to get new units from your reserve. So at the start of the game, you'll have two units in your reserve because of your 12, you've put 10 on the board. To recruit, what you would do is spend one prayer point per one unit that you want to recruit. So if you're recruiting one, one prayer point. If you're recruiting two, two prayer points. Simple as that. You would then place these units in your home city. It does have to be your home city. If you have taken over areas of an opposing player's city, you cannot recruit directly to there. So if we look at this blue player's city here, he already has five units in each of these two districts. So if he chose to recruit, he wouldn't be able to recruit in either of those two districts because you can only ever have five units in a space. So let's say you wanted to recruit two, he would have to recruit them to this district here. It doesn't matter that there's no pyramid there. But let's just say he didn't have five in these. He had four in each of these and two here, and he chose to do a recruit action. When he does his recruit, they do not all have to go to the same district. So it could spend two prayer points to recruit two units and choose to put one here and one here in two separate districts. If you were recruiting enough, you could distribute them across all three districts if you so wished. Next, let's look at a situation like this. So this yellow player has invaded the blue player's city and taken over this central district. As I have already said, the yellow player would not be able to recruit there because it is not their home city. However, it is still the blue player's home city despite the fact that it has been taken over by the yellow. So they could do their two recruit and recruit directly into where the yellow player is, thereby initiating a battle. Let's imagine for a second a situation where this blue player has raised their white pyramid to a level of four using the raise pyramid action. They would immediately get one of these white temporary victory points with a picture of a pyramid on it. And that would sit in front of them. As long as they keep control of that pyramid, they keep that victory point. But what happens if these guys go off invading elsewhere and this yellow player manages to come in and take this district containing that level four pyramid? Well, in that situation, the blue player would have to give the white temporary pyramid victory point to the yellow player because they now control that. When the yellow player was controlling that four point py white pyramid, 
they would also be able to buy power tiles as if that was their own pyramid. So the last action we have yet to talk about is moving. Now this is the most complicated of the actions in the game, largely because, as I already said, when you recruit you may end up with a battle, but it's very unlikely, whereas moving will often result in a battle, because a battle will happen any time you have two opposing players in the same area. And of course, these areas are marked by the lines, so the temple have the yellow lines, and the, elsewhere we have the white lines. But before we talk about battles themselves, let's talk about the basics of movement. So every tr troop, and a troop is a group of units, has a base movement of one. What that means is, say, this unit here could move one space to an adjacent. So from their city, they could move here as it's the only adjacent space. Or I suppose if you wanted, you could move within the city, but they wouldn't be able to move here because that would be too many units in the same place. So let's say they move to here and then their next action comes around and they choose to move again. So from here, they could move back into any of the city spaces, except where they already have five units. They could move into this space in the middle here, or they could move one into this temple, or one to here. All of those would be valid moves of one space. It is possible, from other effects and abilities, to have more than one movement. So let's say they had two movement. They could go one, two, to reach this temple. So the demonstrations there I was giving was all ground movement, which is the most basic form of movement. However, there's also harbour crossings. Now, harbours are marked by blue arrows. So let me bring this closer. And there you go, you can see the blue arrow. So when you do do a harbour crossing, you can move from one space across the blue arrow to the next space. So from this harbour here, they can move either into this temple or into here. Next, we have the most common form of movement, and this is teleportation. Now, it does require you to spend two prayer points each time you teleport, but it's an easy, quick way to get to anything of importance, because all the temples and locations that are going to give you prayer points and victory points, etc., have these obelisks. And Teleporting allows you to go from any pyramid to an obelisk for two prayer points. So you can see that was a quick way to reach that temple that over land would have taken two movement. Additionally, that doesn't actually use your point of movement. So you could teleport for two prayer points and then if you wanted, move out. However, keep in mind that if you teleport to a location with troops already there of an opposing player, it will immediately start a battle and thereby end your movement. Also, please, please, please remember, because everyone seems to have trouble with this, that you cannot teleport from an obelisk back to your city. You can only teleport to obelisks, not away from them. So once you are there, you are out in the wilds and need to fend for yourself. Also, bear in mind that when you are recruiting, you will be recruiting in your city, not in the temple where your units are. So you cannot immediately bolster those without doing a movement as well as doing the recruitment. You can do the movement in any order you want if you're doing teleportation, harbour or ground movement. For example, you could go... Use your one space of movement to move from here to where the pyramid is in order to teleport from the pyramid. Or you could, say, teleport to there, and if you had two spaces of movement, use one to go there and two to go there. Okay, so we have one final thing to discuss on movement before we move on to the battles. And this is walls. So we're going to need another player on the board, so let's put our yellow player out here. So it's important to note that your own walls have no effect on you. So this blue player can move freely over these walls with no concern. However, for this yellow player, what these walls mean is that they have to start a, their move adjacent to the wall to be able to move over it. So let me explain. So normally you have one point of movement, but let's say these yellow people 
had a boost and had two points of movement and they teleported to there. Now the reason they've done this is because they want to get after this pyramid. They want to take the blue player's pyramid. So they teleport to here for two prayer points. They've still got their two movement and they go one, oh no, we hit the walls. They can't use their second point of movement to enter there. What this means is that players always have a small window of warning when a player is going up. Another player is going to go after their own city. However, there are effects that will allow you to ignore the walls. But also, of course, they could go in the same round, teleport to their one space of movement. So that was one movement action. And then they do a second movement action on their next turn to go into the city still. So it is still possible within a single round to get into someone's city. Hey, time for what you've been waiting for, battles. So let's look at the situation we have here where the yellow player has invaded this blue player's city and taken their pyramid. Now it's the blue player's turn and he's gonna move five people in. So here we have four yellows and five blue. So in this case, the blue player moved in, so they are deemed the attacker, and the yellow player is the defender. Next, the players will each look at their available battle cards. So at the start of the game, you're going to have six, but this will quickly go down as you have additional battles. So let's talk about the layout of these cards. Now, there are three potential symbols you're going to have on each of the battle cards. They won't all have all the symbols. There's only the one card that does. All players have the same battle cards to begin with. So here we have the battle strength symbol, the damage symbol, and the defense symbol. The number next to it then represents how much of that the card is giving. It's important to note that each of the units in a battle will always give a combat strength of one. So in the situation here where we have four yellow units and five blue, blue currently has a combat strength of five and yellow a combat strength of four. But the cards will then alter that. After looking at your battle cards, you'll be picking out two of them. One of those you'll be picking to actually use in the fight and you'll be placing face down near the board so that players know you have selected it. The second card you are going to be playing face down in your discards. So once you have used all your battle cards, that is then when you will shuffle them and be able to select from all six again. So let's say we've done one battle, we played one card face down and we've discarded one. We're left with only four to choose from until we've used them all, at which point we'll get them back again. Obviously, when I say use them all, I mean selected them. So what we have is a situation where after three combats you will have all of your cards back every time. As well as selecting your battle card you may also choose to play a divine intervention card. Now only divine intervention cards that have the battle symbol are able to be played and additionally if they have any prayer point cost you must be able to pay that prayer point cost when the card is revealed. So any of these you are playing, what you do is when you are selecting your battle card, you hide the divine intervention card underneath so that no one knows you have played it. Once each player has selected their battle card, so we've got the blue players here and then the yellow player plays this one. Each player would then reveal their battle cards. If they reveal any divine intervention cards, they would also flip those over, revealing those and paying the cost to use them. Next, what you do is you determine the winner. Now, the winner is whoever has the most battle strength. So as already said, battle strength is reflected by the side icons and each of your units gives you one battle strength. So the yellow player here has played a battle strength of three and has four units and the blue player has played a battle strength of two and has five units. In a situation like this where you have a draw, the winner is the defender, so the yellow player would win. But let's say they played this card instead, which only gave them a battle strength of one. 
So in this case, because the yellow only have a battle strength of 5 and the blue have a battle strength of 7, the blue player, the attacker, will be the winner. So then the next thing you look at is casualties from the battle. The way you would work out casualties is you look at the damage, which is the blood drop, so that is the amount of damage a player is doing. So the yellow player is doing free damage, for example, to the blue player. And then you minus the defense symbols. So the blue player had one defense symbol. That means they would suffer two casualties. So you'd simply remove two from the board. If we had a situation where the yellow player was actually doing five casualties, we would remove all units from the board. This would mean that the blue player won because they had the higher battle strength, but all their units are dead. Obviously, he's still the winner, but it means that he won't actually get any victory points for the battle. But in the situation we had, of course, he had three left, and we have yet to do the damage on the yellow player. So let's look at that. Well, we have four damage and no protection. So four units would be lost and would go away. And the next step of battle is awarding victory points. So if the defender wins, so we'll talk about that original situation where there was a draw on the battle strength. The defender would have won that, but they would not get a victory point. You only get a victory point if you're the attacker. So the situation we have, of course, is yellow or white out and blue one, which would mean they would get one of these red square permanent battle victory points. It's important you make sure to have it the right way up because the brown side are not battle victory points, only the red side. And the battle victory points are used for determining tiebreakers on victory points. As already stated, if the blue player had actually been wiped out, Despite winning, they would not get this victory point. They only get it if they are the attacker and have units left. Let's imagine for a minute that the yellow player was not wiped out, that they still had this one lonely guy left here having been defeated. What will then happen with them? Well, whenever a player loses a battle, they have two choices. They can either recall the troops or retreat. If they are retreating, the battle's winner will determine where they go. So in this situation, obviously, blue won, yellow lost. So yellow has a choice between recalling or retreating. So let's say he's retreating. Blue player then dictates where he goes to. It has to be a space free of any units, and it has to be an adjacent space. So that is retreating. But what about recalling? Well, as I said, this yellow player currently has two options. They can either retreat, at which point the blue player picks where they move to, or they can recall. Now, both the loser and the winner can choose to recall any units left at the end of a battle. Now, the reason you might want to do this if you're the winner is, say you were at a temple and you won and you were left with one unit. That's a really hard thing to defend. You could just recall that unit and get a prayer point per unit you recall. What will happen with those recalled units is they'll just go back into your reserve so that you can recruit them with a recruit action later. It is not possible, though, to choose to recall some units and not all of them. If you're recalling your units, you must recall all of them. So the next thing to discuss is these. And these are the seven creatures you get with the game. Now, you'll gain these creatures when you purchase the corresponding power tile. When you do so, you'll immediately put the creature down in one of your free city districts that contains a unit. Let's say the blue player bought a power tile that gave them a creature. They would immediately place that creature in either this district or this district. If they did have at least a unit here, they could have placed it in this district here. What these creatures will do is they'll give special powers and benefits to the troop that they're with. So in this case, this elephant here is with these three blue 
units. So that group of units is then getting a benefit from that creature. Now it's important to note this creature does not count as a unit. So the limit of five units to a space the creatures do not count towards. So please be aware that you cannot have more than one unit on a single troop at a time. So let's say this blue player bought another creature. They couldn't choose to place that creature in here, but they could place it with this other troop here. As I've already said about the creatures not counting as a unit for determining how many units you're allowed in the space, they also don't count as a unit when it comes to counting up the battle strength. So here we only have three units, so that would only be plus three. It's only if the creature has a benefit that would give any combat strength that they will be giving any benefit of combat strength. Finally, these creatures can never be destroyed. So if you lose a battle and all of these units get wiped out, what happens to this creature is it would simply go to a different group of units in your city. Now, if you don't have any units in your city, when you either get the creature or the units that the creature is with die, what would happen is it would go into your reserve where all your units are waiting to be recruited and then whenever you do a recruit action you can choose to include that creature with it. So as we said in the setup the temples have a round temporary victory point on. If the blue player teleported in there they would then be classed as controlling that temple and would get that temporary victory point. That would then sit in front of them. However if there was then a battle and the blue player was knocked out of that temple, leaving the yellow player there, the yellow player has then gained control of that temple. They have been victorious and they get that temporary temple victory point to go sit in front of them. If you have a situation where there is a battle, say over this temple here, which was being controlled by the yellow player, and all the units get wiped out. What then happens with the victory point is it simply goes back to the temple because no one's controlling it. And then whoever first goes to that temple will take it. Earlier on I mentioned about how the day phase had two different stages. So we've talked a lot about using the actions tokens to select the actions. Once you have gone through and each player has done their five actions, you would then do the attribution of prayer points and the permanent victory points stage of the day phase. How this would work? Well, let's say this blue player controlled this temple over here. It says in the bar here that it grants two prayer points. So they would immediately gain two prayer points. If they controlled multiple temples, they would gain the prayer points for each of those temples. So. If they did control two or more temples, they would get a permanent temple victory point token. So as well as the ordinary temples that give you prayer points, at this time there are two special temples. So let's talk about the one that's most relevant, which is the two and four player side temple. With this one, you can sacrifice one unit you have there. So let's say the blue player had three units there. They could at this stage, when they're collecting their prayer points and victory points, they could choose to sacrifice one unit to gain five prayer points. That sacrificed unit will just go back to their reserve. But if, let's say, they only had the one and they did that, they'd lo then lose the temporary victory point they had for controlling that temple. And then the other special building is the Sanctuary of All Gods, this blue one here. So let's say the blue player had, oh, that's far too many units. Let's say they had five units in there. At this point, they can choose to sacrifice two units to gain one permanent victory point. And of course, this doesn't count as a temple. So if they had two, they could still sacrifice those two to gain a permanent one. And they wouldn't be giving back a temporary one because they never got a temporary one for taking it over. We talked near the beginning of the video about how the goal of this game was to get to eight victory points. So 
we come to the end of a day phase and we have a situation like this where two players have got to eight victory points. That means it's the end of the game one way or another. But who has actually won? Well, in this situation, because we have a draw on the victory points, whoever has the most red battle victory points would win. So despite, let's say, this player having got to eight victory points first, because they don't have the most battle victory points, they wouldn't win the game. This player would come first and this one second. Of course, if we had an easy situation, say, like this, where one player had got to eight victory points and one player had got only to six, obviously the clear winner is the player with the eight. And that would apply even if we had a situation where we had seven and they had the most battle. It doesn't matter that they had the most battle victory points because there was no draw to settle. So that is how you play Comet. I hope you have found this video interesting and useful. I hope you will come back and watch the rest of the videos in this series, as well as looking at the rest of the videos on the channel and subscribing to the channel. And please do also share the channel with your friends and family, because they might enjoy it if you did, and I hope that they will. So, thanks for watching, and as always, bye for now.